Yeah, so this, this kind of dovetails with what Adam described because now I'll talk about the tools that we actually, or we're using to do these kinds of analyses. And uh, that's what I've been working on at the Sanger for the past year and uh, some months now. So I think, I think the basic idea is pretty clear, but I'll just go through it so it's even more clear. And most of what I'll talk about actually is just, is just data model and serialization so that we can have a common language to describe these things. So the idea is that you have sequences on nodes and the edges represent allowed linkages between them. And you could take a walk through this graph and you'll, you'll make some genome that may exist. Or like, this is a model of a bunch of genomes, some of which might exist, some of which might be just allowed. Uh, and so just to point out two things which I think are really important to remember is that this is not this isn't like really novel stuff. You know, people have been doing this since the very early days of bioinformatics. So a multiple sequence alignment is a particular class of this. So if, yeah, actually, that would be helpful. Thanks. I like the point as well. Okay, so, so if you had an MSA with two protein sequences, you could make a consensus by kind of picking which one of these to choose at each position. And then you could imagine compressing this as well so that you have an alignment and there's parts that match positionally. And some of them there might be mismatches as well and some there might be gaps or effective kinds of insertions. And, and then this thing here, this is, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So this, this is maybe a single base kind of version of it, but it's exactly the same concept. And, and this, so this is from a paper in 2002. There's also work done in 2001 on it, but it was about building these um, using progressive alignment against such a graph. So you can align new reads into it and efficiently build up a multiple sequence alignment. And so also, if we, if we keep this general, we don't say things like, oh, we have to have an acyclic graph or um, you know, we, we want it to be unidirectional. If we let it be a bidirectional cyclic graph, uh, then they are also equivalent to a variety of assembly graphs. You can convert a De Bruyne graph into that, into the same structure. And you can also take a string graph. So that's a, that's a kind of assembly graph where repeated sequences, which are here represented by, this is the, the input genome, say. We've got reads and these are repeated sequences, which are bigger than our reads. Then these get compressed in our assembly graph. And we're left with, with some novel sequences linking them. This is also the same kind of structure. So we could, we could conceivably use that actually as the, this variation graph or population <coughs> reference graph or whatever you'd like to call it. So one, another important thing, and this is something I think I, I have to admit, I, I really learned in the process of doing this because my initial implementations were all based around uh, acyclic graphs and, and just the forward complements of them. But if you, if you really want to represent all kinds of variation that happen in genomes succinctly, you need to model DNA molecules appropriately. And DNA molecules have, have two sides. And there's, so there's a forward and reverse complement. And uh, if you have inversions, then you'll go from the, the forward to the reverse. And you can also have uh, cycles as well. So uh, like, for example, a cycle might occur if you had an expan expansion of a certain region or contraction of it. You might represent that most succinctly as a cycle through that, through that region. So they're kind of like train track graphs because they have two sides. And pretty much anything you see happening in this, in this toy can also happen in this model. And I won't, I won't really go into it here, but maybe you, in the hackathon we'll be using these visualizations to understand what's going on with some of the graphs we make. But as a simple visual language, you can represent all the different kinds of links by, by maybe representing each node as, as a box with a sequence and ID on it. And a forward link would go from, maybe, would go from this corner to this corner. An inverting link from forward to reverse would go this way. A, a, the other inversion would go this way. And then if you, if you think about it, the, this is implying it's like, this forward link implies it's reverse as well. And every, every single one implies it's reverse. So uh, reversing, reversing would actually, you'd represent it that way. I mean, you, you could represent it the other way, but it just gets confusing. So that's, that's just a, a note about the, the model. And so what you have, um, yeah, this is from the VG long read assemb assemblies which were made. But the basic idea is that you don't just want to have the sequences, you want to label things in them too. And the simplest way to do that is to think of traces or threads, as, as Adam is calling them, or paths or walks, like whatever you want to call them. Some, something that traverses a series of nodes and edges and, and maybe provides a way to link annotations into the system. And also, 
you know, th this structure doesn't exist in nature. This is a compression, right? So the, the sequences are what matters. The sequences are actually what we're interested in. So these are a bunch of individuals, and we can walk each, each one of them through, and we can actually think about their relationship to each other, even in, in rather complex regions where there's several things happening. Like effectively here, some individuals have two bases, others have one, some individuals have one, but it's different. You know, it's, it's a lot happening, but it's, it's quite compact. Um, so this is, this is the essential pieces of what I'll call a variation graph. So the model, which I'll, I'm actually going to get into technical detail because I think most of the people in the audience want to do that. Um, the model is that we have a graph that's comprised of edges and nodes and paths. And the paths actually are rather complex. I'm not even showing them completely here, but I'll, I'll describe it in, in the, the following pages. But it's effectively a series, it's like a walk of a series of mappings across nodes. So it's, it's a path, a walk through the graph. This is the whole, so what, what's on the following slides is actually pretty much the whole data schema. It's written in protobuf, which is a, a schema description language that you can, you, you write a, a document in this language and then you can compile it into, into various programming languages to make APIs to read and write these kinds of data. Yeah, so a graph is a vector of nodes, edges, and paths, and then we have some annotation. We can apply arbitrary annotations to everything. Um, a node is just linking, it's just linking a sequence, an ID, and maybe some other auxiliary information. I'm actually not using any of these right now, but uh, they're in the schema. An edge will link from, the from one node to another. So these IDs here are meant to map back into this ID of the node. And it could be the same one, right? It could be a self-link. And you can link from this, it, you can have a natural link sort of like from the, the three prime end of the sequence into the five prime of the next one. Or you could be going on the reverse direction. And if you did that, you'd say you're coming from the start. And if you're also going into the reverse end of the, like relative to the way it's represented in the, the sequence of the node, then you could say you're going to the end. And so we can use these two flags to represent all the different kinds of, of links that happen. So pat, paths are really important because you can do a bunch of stuff with them. So you can, you can have haplotypes, so sequences that you use to construct the graph. You can describe mappings of reads, alignments into the graph. And you can also describe just relationships between different parts of the graph this way. And I think really importantly, they're a way to embed annotations into the system. So we can say this is a gene in this graph and it has a name and it walks through these nodes and that's pretty straightforward. That, that actually linearizes it, makes it easier to think about. And all the path is is a, is a series of these mappings. And so what is a mapping? A mapping is at some position in the graph, there's a series of edits to the graph that take it from one, <coughs> one sequence to another. And the idea with this is that this position I should get into, maybe it's a little bit mixed up to describe it this way, but basically the position is on a node. And so we have a node ID and an offset, and we also can have it on the forward or reverse strand. So it can re represent any position in the, in the graph and it's your first complement. And so we start at some position, and then we have a series of edits. What is an edit? Edit is an edit operation that takes us from one sequence to another. And the, the trivial edit is a match. So you would go... So if, say, the from length and the to length are equal, and maybe as a matter of convenience we don't write the sequence in, then that would imply that we just step through both sequences and together there's no differences between them at all. But if we want to represent the differences from this, the system, then it's actually very easy to do so because we can say, like a SNP would have the same from length and to length but a different sequence. So it's saying that if we, take, we go from the basis to the new sequence and then replace the that sequence with this one, then we, you know, we get the new sequence that way. Insertions, as you imagine, you go from a length of zero to a length of some sequence that you're adding, and then deletions would go the other way. The from length would be, would be positive, and the to length would be zero. And then you could also have different kinds of, you can describe any kind of arbitrary edit in the system. There's no limitation to it. But this really rationalizes something that we've had in in uh, kind of NGS bioinformatics for a while, which is the cigar, <coughs> cigar operations that you see describing a pairwise alignment of a read and a reference. 
which I found very difficult to think about. And, and so this, this just trivializes the process of describing that function, the translation. Excuse yeah. Me, what's yeah. A skip? Oh, a skip. Um, actually, I think I probably should remove this. <laughs> <laughs> so these, uh, yeah, there's certain concepts of like hard clips and soft clips, and I was trying to map those from the BAM format into, into this, but I, I ended up not using it. I just described. So this is saying you can have a soft clip. Now a soft clip is just a, it's just an insertion on the end of one sequence relative to the other. So it's just easier to represent it as an insertion. So I need to actually really erase this from the repo. Okay, so, so for serialization, for practical purposes, it helps to break the graph into pieces. There, there are different ways you can have it in one um, contained whole, but if you break it into pieces, then you can organize parallel operations on it and um, it, it kind of gets around certain problems with parsing the serialized format. So all these all these things I was describing before, you can you can use them to build up a binary representation or a JSON representation, and then that that has a trivial kind of serialization which you can execute. And, and rel it's relatively performant to do. And yeah, although we're using protobuf three to do it, which is new and incompatible with everything, in time we we should uh, we should achieve global compatibility with a lot of different languages so that. The, the problem of writing parsers to work with these kinds of systems becomes very, very minimal. So that said, the, the next bit is like, what is in this toolkit? What can you do with the thing? So the most, yeah, I'm just walking through a basic workflow that looks a lot like resequencing analysis. So first we'll make a graph, then we'll index it so that we can quickly find bits and pieces of it. And we can then, then play with the query operations we can do different kinds of sampling, so we're actually going to simulate reads from it, and then we'll, we'll uh, map the reads back and call variants against the graph. And it's mostly there, but this is so we can actually play with this later. But it's just an overview of what of what it looks like. Could you make a yeah. hands-on seminar this evening? Or yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, absolutely. Be happy to. Yeah. So. So there's different, so VG is structured as this one monolithic binary that has a bunch of sub functions inside of it. And so VG construct is an algorithm that will, or it's a, it's a based around one algorithm that takes a VCF file and a reference. So you have a list of differences against the VCF file, uh, against the reference, encoding the VCF here. So you have this, this is our input FASTA. If I just give this to VC, VG construct, it just makes the trivial primary graph, the basis graph. Um, and, and so there's one node and has the whole sequence in it. But then if I have a VCF file with a bunch of SNPs in it, um, I can then encode these into that graph using VG construct. And the thing that I get, if I've output it to tiny VG, I can render it and it looks like this. And, and it's this a bit, I actually didn't explain this earlier, but the sequence name is hashed into a color uh, emoji combination. And that makes it a lot easier when you have lots and lots of paths to think about where they're going in the graph. Because then you can annotate elements of the graph with that. So here we have the gray saxophone, which is kind of sad. But um, that's what happens if you give it X. And you can see that it, you can actually retrace the original sequence by walking the edges that are labeled by the saxophone. Which I, think are, I think it's going down, actually. Um, but that's, yeah, that's the basic idea. So now we've made, this, we've made a variation graph. Then to, to index it, it's just another command. This one, what it does is it takes the graph and it makes, makes, it, makes actually two indexes. One of them is, is what's called an XG index, and that's a, a succinct data structure based uh, transformation of the graph that takes just a few times, well, here it's not clear, but <laughs> it usually takes just a few times the amount of memory as the compressed graph, like the amount of disk space and, and RAM to work on it. Um, and then there's the GCSA2 index, which allows you to, to look up. Um, it, it's kind of like a, well, Yoni will hopefully describe it, but it basically indexes paths to the graph so that we can look them up by, by those, their sequence label. And so then we get this thing. And it's all organized by uh, extracting the k-mers of the graph. You, you turn the graph into a De Bruyne graph, and then this can be fed into GCSA2. And all those files are binary? They're all binary. This is a compressed binary. This is a succinct kind of binary structure, and then this is a succinct and compressed one. But yeah, Yoni will describe it in more detail. So then you can, you can take these indices and query them. So like I can say, uh, give me the part of this graph that's close to position 20 to 25 on the sequence called X. 
and I give it the XG index, and then I'm piping it through VG view to view it. Looks like that. And actually, I say so. Step out one node, so you, you do like this neighborhood search. And yeah, I'm one or two more slides. Okay. Okay. And yeah, and then we can also can say, hey, I have this sequence. Where does it exist in in this graph? And and so if I look for this one, it's it's at the it's on the reverse strand of the ninth node, like here. So basically, going back this way. And, and that's, yeah, so that just proves that the functionality works. I can simulate from the graph. So like I said, these are models of all the genomes that, that might exist. Uh, well, they're a model of some set of genomes. So if I were to modify the graph by adding in some new SNPs, then I can, I can sample reads from it. So now I'm sampling some reads across these. And then I can map them using the same indices. There's a mapping algorithm. And it also, it, it uses a, a pairwise SIMD accelerated uh, alignment algorithm locally to derive a, a kind of precise alignment of the, of the read against the graph. And then, then what, what you get out of this, so you do an alignment, you give it a camera size. And if I view that alignment file using VG view, it converts it to JSON, I can look at it. And so there's, you see that there's a sequence and then there's a path. And the path, in this case, it's perfect matches. But in some cases, you have mismatches, which I can also visualize as well. This isn't the prettiest visualization, but it's good for debugging. And basically, across each one of the nodes is the JSONification of the mapping. And so I can see that there, there's some mismatches here, which remember matches what I've done here. I've broken this node and added this one here. And um, then zooming in, you can actually see that it's, act, you know, it's in fact mapping and finding these variants against the graph appropriately. And then finally, there's, there's a whole calling algorithm. I won't get into that. Um, at the time when I did these slides, it wasn't ready, in, but I think it's been improved. But the idea is that you, you would align, you get this graph pileup, which is kind of described here, and then you can find variants, and you get this kind of augmented graph, and you can also make a sample graph as well. And so that's it. And there's a bunch of people who helped help me with this, and I guess I've, I've helped as well in their research. So, <coughs> cool. Thank you very much.